Okay, so thanks very much for coming. So it will be in English, sorry, today. But um, the, this is ICTP SAFER, which is part of the Institute of Physica Theorica, which is part of UNESP. And we regularly have activities for people. This is their first activity. If you want information about other activities, you can sign uh, your, your email address and we'll contact you. So although these um, distinguished public lectures, we only have two or three times a year, we have monthly uh, informal discussions or seminars or lectures, depending on how you want to say it, at, at a bar. And next semester, uh, we'll be starting August 3rd, which is Thursday of next week, which will be part two of Matthias's talk. So Matthias is going to talk about the early, early universe, and uh, Raul Abramo from uh, the physics department at USP will talk about uh, information from the stars, a final que está escrito nas estrelas. And this will be in uh, a new place, it's called Tubaina Bar. So it's near uh, Metro Consolação, um, and if you want more information, you can go to our webpage, or if you, again, if you put your email, you'll get email about it. Okay, so um, actually this week and last week, we were organizing a school about cosmology, so Matias is here not just to lecture, um, for a public lecture, but he's been lecturing at the school. And, and Rafael Porter is, is the main organizer of this school, so he's going to introduce Matias for the lecture. Just, uh, a few words. Uh, we're very happy to have Matias Alarriaga from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Matias got uh, his PhD from MIT in 1998, and then he moved on to a few faculty positions in NYU, Harvard, and then the Institute for Advanced Study. He has received uh, several awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship for his work in cosmology, and he's going to tell us today about the history of the universe. So, let's uh, welcome Matthias. Thanks uh, very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Um, so, please, uh, if you have questions, stop me along the way. I know I'm speaking in English, and for some of you it might not be your... Um, native language, and so uh, just feel free to, to, to stop me if, uh, if I say something that uh, you, don't, you don't understand. So uh, my goal today is to talk about cosmology um, and the progress that we've made in understanding the history of our universe in the last, uh, well, let's say the last century or so, but I will try to, um, I will try to um, focus on the l things that have been happening in the, late in, in, in the last uh, decade or so. Um, so cosmology, I in some sense, it, it is a historical type of science in many ways. What we do is we find fossils from the past, things left over from the early epochs of the universe, and we try to figure out what happened. Not very different from what a historian might do or a paleontologist that finds fossils and tries to sort out what happened uh, based on on uh, what you get, um, what, what you can find. We use the laws of physics to interpret those uh, things that we find, those fossils, and, um, and we you know, try to reconstruct what happened. Uh, it turns out that um, one complication that we usually face is that as we find fossils from earlier times in the history of the universe, sometimes um, the laws of physics that we have measured in the laboratory are not perhaps applicable or we don't know um, exactly what are the physical processes that might happen in the conditions of the universe in these very early times. So in many situations we are left uh, in a complicated state in which we find something, we need to try to understand how physics works, conditions that uh, we have in the laboratory, so we are both trying to sort the history of the universe and also the laws that are needed to, to try to understand what happened. So as we go back in time, things uh, become more and more dicey, more and more uh, uncertain, okay? So we know very well what was happening in the late history of the universe as we go back in time. Obviously, it becomes more and more um, difficult, and this is similar in all branches, all type of historical s studies like that, right? So uh, same, th same thing uh, in paleontology or whatever. You, it's more difficult to find things from the past and more difficult to understand. So um, in this talk, uh, Let's first, let's first discuss what, 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 uh, what uh, is the model of our universe we, we, we currently have. So one thing that has happened throughout the last hundred years, but 
um, is that we've been, I think we've made a lot of progress in trying to reconstruct this history of the universe. So let me start by s um, summarizing very quickly what we think happened for the most part of the history of the universe, so that we are all in the same page, okay? So um, we think the universe uh, in the past was very different than what it is today. Uh, and most of these are not j is not a th is, is not a theory. It's just basi basically the result of the things that we have found. So the universe in the past was much different. So it was expanding. Mas the universe today is expanding. In the past, it was expanding much faster than it was that it's expanding today. So perhaps today it takes 14 billion years for the universe to become twice as big. In the past, in a small fraction of a second, the universe became twice as big. So it was expanding much faster. It was also much denser. The all the material in the universe was more uh, in a smaller region, okay? The material that we see in uh, the part of the universe that we see today was in a smaller region, so it was denser. It was also hotter. Um, and so w um, we call this picture of the universe the hot Big Bang because it starts very hot, it starts expanding very fast, it slows down, everything cools down, and that's what we call the hot Big Bang. Uh, throughout this period of time, as it cools down, different things happen. So, for example, around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the first atoms form, the hydrogen atoms form. Um, at some much later time, like a billion years after, the, after this initial time, the first stars form. So there are many things that happen, and they start happening sequentially. At the beginning, the universe is so hot that various processes cannot happen. Eventually, they can start to happen. And we've reconstructed this history that for the purpose of this talk I will call the hot Big Bang. And two things that are very important, uh, that, that have been very important uh, as tools uh, for us to reconstruct this history and, uh, and are going to be featured quite uh, prominently in this talk are from the side of the theory that we have to use, the theory of gravity of Einstein general relativity. Um, and from the point of view of the observations, something that we call the cosmic microwave background, which is light left over from the very beginning of the hot Big Bang. And in the case of the um, uh, of gra general relativity, has played a role in, in cosmology from the very beginning, both of general relativity and of cosmology, or at least cosmology as we, as we do it today. So you may know that the, the theory of Einstein of general relativity, he wrote the paper in 1915, so a little bit over 100 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, the astronomers uh, were figuring out a lot of things about the universe. Uh, so, for example, roughly around that time, astronomers were able to figure out uh, distances to things using some type of star called Cepheid variables. Eventually, they, they realized that what they were calling nebulae in the sky were actually other galaxies, that they were moving away from us. Eventually, this led to the discovery by Hubble of the expansion of the universe. And as you can see uh, in this history here, all of those things were happening around that time. At the same time that Einstein put forward this theory of relativity, people were starting to find solutions, a solution of, uh, uh, for a universe that was expanding. Um, this you know, pa paper for, uh, for, uh, from Einstein uh, trying to use GR to explain the, the, the theory of gravity to explain the entire universe in 1917, very, very near the w when he put forward his, uh, his theory. And uh, the, the, the discovery of the acceleration of the universe was happening, you know, very all of this at the same time. So at the beginning of cosmology, uh, GR and, uh, and the discoveries of astronomy, so how big the universe was, what was happening that, you know, it's a big, big discovery to think that you go from a, a galaxy of stars, which you think is the whole universe, to realize that these little clouds are actually galaxies just like yours, super far away, and then realizing that the thing is expanding, and so it's super old and much, much bigger than you really thought. All of these things uh, were happening at that time. Roughly, a few, you know, s uh, some, sometime uh, later, people also started uh, uh, thinking about uh, um, the early times of the history of the universe and realizing that if you go back into the past, if the universe was indeed hotter and uh, denser, nuclear reactions could take place. And these people figure out that light elements like helium and deuterium would be produced like in nuclear reactions in the very early universe in the first few minutes. They would be left over and from and, and they thought that the helium of the universe would actually be produced at this time. And from matching the abundance, they predicted that there should be leftover from this period in which the universe was very hot, 
a radiation that would fill the universe, light that would fill the universe, that, uh, um, that you should be able to see perhaps with telescopes. And this was discovered in 1965, um, and we are celebrating roughly the 50th anniversary of a few years ago it was both the 100th anniversary of general relativity and the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the cosmic microwave background which is this light that was left over from from the very early times in the in the history of the big bang when everything was very hot um, it was discovered by these two guys Pencils and Wilson using this antenna which sits in uh, New Jersey in uh, the United States um, and the papers came out in 1965 um, and since then, the cosmic microwave background, better and better studies of the cosmic microwave background have played a very crucial role in, uh, in us being able to piece out that history that I, I told you about. The first thing that started to happen is that people measured with, very, uh, with a lot of precision how much light of this cosmic microwave background you were receiving in different colors or frequencies of the light. So this is not really light that you can see with your eyes, it's light that you can detect with the radio telescopes in the microwave, but um, so still y you can think that this light has the equivalent of different colors and you can measure how much light you get in the different colors and eventually uh, this was measured very precisely at the beginning. This is measurements uh, by already by the year 1990 of the amount of light versus the, the color. And it follows a very, uh, very distinctive curve that physicists call a black body spectrum, which is the light, which is the spectrum that is emitted by something which is uh, at a given temperature in thermal, in, in thermal equilibrium. Okay? So this was the uh, proof that the, in the early universe thing was so dense that, I that the particles were interacting with each other so rapidly to be in thermal equilibrium and producing this radiation as you would get for uh, something at a give, you know, hot thing uh, that you put in, uh, I mean, uh, in, in, the, in, in the laboratory and you measure the, the amount of light that comes out. Um, so that was, uh, th that part is, if you want, the, this was, and, and, and in fact, the, the amount of light that they, that they saw and the temperature that they got for this black body spectrum was exactly what was predicted by these guys that I mentioned before, um, um, that uh, were, um, uh, let's see, that were um, thinking about the production of the light elements. So they said they should, if the universe indeed was expanding this fast, and they, they could ca calculate how the universe, how fast it was expanding using the laws of gravity from general relativity of Einstein. They do the calculation using the nuclear physics that people knew at the time. They saw that in that case you should produce certain amount of helium. They went out on the stars, saw the amount of helium that there was. With that they infer how much of this radiation there should be. And, you know, some years later, in 1965, this was found exactly uh, pretty much as predicted. So this is a big success. Um, and uh, it cemented this picture of the universe starting very hot and the, the, the hot Big Bang picture. So one thing that we'll, uh, you will see throughout this talk is this, um, is this um, constant um, interplay into, into things that you can calculate using the laws of physics. Then you go out there and try to see if you see it, and if you see it, you get some confidence that what you were thinking about that was happening actually happened, you can predict something else, and so on and so forth. And that's how we build out this model of the universe that I'm telling you about. So I'm, now I'm, I'm, I'm going over things that happened a long time ago, but I will, I will speed up to get to the, to the present. Okay? So another thing that, uh, that happened uh, later oops, was that uh, people started measuring the amount of radiation of this cosmic microwave background that they, that they got in different directions, and eventually they realized that the amount of radiation is not exactly the same in every direction, uh, that there were little differences that we call anisotropies in the microwave background. And so when you look in certain directions, you see get, get a little bit more. When you look in some other directions, you get a little bit less. Um, this was discovered by the same uh, experiment satellite that, that did this measurement of the spectrum. Um, and, and those played a huge role in, in the subsequent uh, um, evolution of our understanding of the universe. So, so this measurement in 1992, what happens is that, the, that, that it launched a, 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 a very um, fast um, um, competition to try to make this measurement better. And by better, I mean uh, trying to, like, w if you have a camera in your phone, more pixels, a better picture to, to know more and more 
uh, in more detail how this temperature was varying as you move your telescope across the sky. The, the first measurements were kind of had a lot of errors, uh, reducing the errors and making better and better maps. Because what people realized immediately is that this light of the cosmic microwave background is coming from us, from this epoch in which the first atoms were four, four formed 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So this is light that has been traveling, the, the universe today is 13.8 billion years old, so has been traveling for a very long time, almost uninterrupted to the telescope. And this map that we are seeing is telling us how, about how the universe was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So once you realize that what you're seeing in your telescope is a fossil from such an early time in the history of the universe, of course everybody is trying to run and try to get the best picture that they possibly can. Okay? And this happened, and, the, and currently this map that had only, you know, it, it looks very smooth because the telescope had a very big pixel, like uh, if you had a camera in your phone with just a few pixels, and so it's a very, very blurry picture. With the decades, it, it turned into this, which is the, se the map of the whole sky, each point uh, I um, in each direction of the sky, the, the color says the temperature, that you get, or the amount of radiation that you get in the different directions, and you see this pattern that perhaps for most people it's uh, you know it's just like a b bunch of blobs. But if if you if you think that what this is telling us is that so um, you look in that direction, the light has been traveling for almost the entire age of the universe from from some place very very far away. Then you point your telescope in that other direction. It's telling you about what was happening in the universe super far away in that direction, almost for the entire age of the universe, uh, uh, the light has been traveling. So you're making a map of how the conditions of the universe pretty much you know, are very, very far away from us. And what, we, and what, what, and what was discovered, uh, and, in, in, and as you will see, is something that people uh, already knew or predicted was going to happen, is that the universe at that time was very different also in the following respect. Today, if you go out with a telescope and look nearby, what do you see? Stars, galaxies? that I will speak more about, but the universe is very inhomogeneous. This map is telling you that w by the time you measure these temperature differences, you realize that they are super small. They are only 10 parts per million. So changes in the amount of radiation that you see only in the fifth decimal place. Okay? So this means that the universe was almost the same everywhere. When you look so far away in these different regions, it was almost the same. But there were these very small differences. Um, so nothing like a universe today, no galaxies, no stars, nothing, okay? So the universe went from being hot and expanding very fast and also very homogeneous with no galaxies, no stars, to the universe that we see today. And this is, in a sense, a picture of some initial conditions, the initial state of the universe, uh, at least 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that somehow turned into what we see today. And trying to understand that, uh, measuring these initial conditions very well and understanding what the, what the universe looked uh, around us and how it could go from one to the other is what allowed us to map out this history in some detail. Um, I mean, w one thing that I, I said that perhaps I should uh, explain again uh, for everybody is that, um, you know, when, when you look at something very far away, okay, um, you're also seeing it how it was in the distant past because light took a long time to, to get it if it's far away, it takes a long time to, to get to us, and so the information, the light, departed a long, long time away uh, ago, right? So this cosmic microwave background is something that we are getting from so far away that it's, it's uh, started traveling when the universe was so young, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That's why, in some, we, in some sense, the telescope act like some kind of time machine. By taking pictures of something very far, we are seeing how the universe, or at least the region of the universe we're taking a picture of, how it was in the distant past. And so because the universe has been changing so, fa uh, so much in its history, as we, t we always want to take pictures of things of different times at different distances to figure out what was happening at different times and try to get this history, okay? Um, sorry, I keep doing that. But so le let, me, let me give you an impressionistic view of the state of cosmology, okay? So, um, so these are the measurements in the terms of the maps, but what happens then is that people analyze this data and produce uh, measurements of various quantities, which I'm not going to explain very much, but 
at all, in fact. But what I want to point, I this is, if you open the typical paper, a typical paper in cosmology analyzing this data, you see plots, figures like this, okay? So let me tell you what I want you to uh, get away from this figure. So this is some measurements related to this map. I'm not going to explain what they are, but I want to explain to you a few things. So there you, you can see points with what we call error bars. Those are the direct measurements directly from this, inf from this map. So stat properties of this map are being plotted here. In fact, what is being plotted here is something to do with the size of the temperature differences as a function of, of the size of some pixels that you make in the map. Okay? And then there is a line. Okay? There is a line. So what is that line? That line is the result of our theoretical calculations of what we expect you to, that we should have seen in the experiment. Okay? So we've built a model, and I will, I, I will tell you what this uh, model um, involves. But basically, this model is the following. You ha start with a universe made of something, some material. What, what will happen next? Okay, this material is there. There's the force of gravity, which plays the central role in this, uh, in this uh, game. So things start to attract each other. Depending on the properties of the material, things will move in a certain way. So we just solve these equations of, of motion, of gravity, uh, and things, how they move under gravity. We assume the universe is has a certain composition, and then we let it go, and we predict what you should see in various experiments at different times, histories, uh, distance from us. And these different plots are things like that, measurement of this, measurement of that. And in all of them, there is a line, which is our best uh, model calculation from what we think should hap be happening. And there's a lot of points with usually very, very small errors, and the line goes through the points, okay? So the fact that we now make all kinds of measurements and they are very, very small error bars and the line goes through the point gives us some uh, confidence that we have an understanding of what's happening because we made a measurement, figure out what was, and we predict what should be some other measurement, we go measure, it works, okay? And this has happened a lot. I'm not going to explain ex all of the details, but it has happened so much that we are very confident in this history that to I told you about, okay? So, um, okay, but so let me, and, and uh, let me, um, great. So this just to tell you that we are super confident that we understand everything, okay? So, um, so this history, we're super confident. And what does it involve? The production of these curves, what does it involve? What goes into this model, okay? As I told you, what goes into this model is the theory of gravity, basically, and then what the universe is made of, okay? And so we don't know what the universe is made of in principle at the beginning, but now we've determined what the universe is made of. How did we determine how the, what the universe is made of? What are the things that made up the universe? Um, by making sure that when we do the calculation, they fit all the, all the different measurements that we have, okay? And so we know what the universe is made of. And as many of you might uh, have heard, the universe is made of the regular matter that you see everywhere and we are made of. But it's also made of two other things. One of them we call dark matter, which we have never seen in the laboratory. And another one, which we call dark energy, which we also have never seen in the laboratory. So most of the universe is made up of things that we uh, have not uh, yet discovered in the lab. Uh, but we are super sure that this is uh, what happens. Um, and um, so this dark matter is some, uh, something, some material, and probably some particle left over from the beginning of the universe, just like the regular matter and the he hydrogen and helium I told you were produced a few minutes after the Big Bang. We think the dark matter is something that was produced even much earlier in the history of the Big Bang and it's left over around and is responsible for, uh, for making structure grow and going from the, what we see in the CMB to what we see in the galaxies that we see in the late universe. Okay? So, and then there is some other uh, component of the universe that we call the, the dark energy, which um, so an another very big surprise that, uh, that we came across, uh, we in, uh, in general, the uh, cosmologists, studying, uh, studying um, how the, the universe expands as a function of its history. We realize that the at the current time, the expansion of the universe is accelerating, is becoming faster and faster. This was a surprise. Usually, if a universe is made with regular matter as, uh, um, that 
we typically know the force of gravity is uh, attractive, so if you have something that is flying away from each other, expanding, gravity tends to stop this expansion. It turns out in the late universe, the expansion is actually accelerating. Big surprise, okay? So, um, so basically, I I if you sti um, what I want to say is that we have a model, we have a history that we think um, you know, is we are very confident in it because uh, it fits a lot of observations. However, it requires swallowing quite a few new things, okay? Um, that for us are very big discoveries, with thinking that the universe is filled with dark matter, thinking that the universe is filled with dark energy. And, uh, and as a result, we are still puzzled about it, and we, for the, m for the most part, I want to check this for sure. We, we want to double check that we are not inventing something that is completely crazy, okay? Um, and of course, also in the history of the universe, there are other epochs which. So thi these are um, this uh, discovery of the composition of the universe. Uh, it's uh, you know, some major discovery about what the universe is made of, or what we think the universe is made of. Um, but there's also in the history of the universe other periods for which we don't have much information. We haven't been able to take pictures of anything happening at that time, and we just don't know. For example, when the first stars and galaxies actually f started, we don't have much information. So in this slide, what I want you to take away is that, yes, we think we have a very, um, a very nice model that, that explains a lot of observations with great detail and it's a mathematical model, we calculate something and a, a lot of, w it has happened many times that we use this model to calc make a prediction of something we had not already observed and it worked and it worked and it worked and in fact in some sense for the last decade we've been uh, in, in many respects quite, uh, we've, everybody's trying to find a place where this model does not work, okay, because if you're a scientist, you of course get more famous if you shoot down the thing that is believed to be the truth, right? So we are all, and, and also we learn something. So if you make a prediction that you should observe this, and you actually observe it, it's great, you confirm the model, but it would be much better to find a surprise, right? So after we found these surprises which have, you know, have been d around with us for a long time, we haven't been able to break this model, and we are all trying. That's our hope, is that this is wrong, okay? Um, at some level, but, uh, but it doesn't seem to be wrong. Uh, but it's peculiar. And also, uh, other thi so there are various questions that we don't understand, things about the composition, but also at various periods in the history of the universe we have very little information. So there are a lot of things that we, this is not a set completely settled uh, story, but it's a story that is very mature because we have made a lot of measurements and we have predicted things and went and observed them and it works. So Okay, so this is the status of cosmology today. So you might, uh, you might, w when I say, oh, the universe is filled, for example, with this dark matter, this sounds very crazy, something we haven't observed in the lab, we have to make a, take a step back. And this is why I started saying that cosmology is a, cos uh, uh, um, a historical science and we are finding fossils from the past and so on. Of course, in the laboratory, we've made... Uh, we made experiments that probe the, lo the laws of physics in some regimes. Okay, we haven't we haven't made, for example, accelerators that smash particles with a given energy and below, but not above, because we we're not able to to make such a machine yet. And if you just take a look at the history of uh, of uh, of particle physics, you know there was t times when various particles that we know today we didn't know. Right? There's nothing to say that whatever we have found already in the laboratory is all there is. That's of, there's no theorem that says that, right? So the f and it's also the case that the, co the, the, um, um, the conditions of the universe in its early times are very different than anything that we have been able to recreate in the laboratory. So there's of course no, um, no reason to think that the laws of physics as we have understood them in the laboratory today, which of course was different than we understood them 50 years ago, uh, are all there is to be needed to understand the history of the universe, even with times when the thing that was happening, we know wh where we have not been able to do any experiment that probes the kind of temperatures and energies of collisions of particles as were happening in the early universe. So I don't think there's any surprise to think that 
Some other things could be, just as the regular matter or the helium and so on were produced in the early universe, as you go back, other things could have been produced. Okay? We have no information about that. We just see the leftovers and we have no way of reconstructing that in the laboratory, at least to now. So the, the best laboratory that we have for some of these things is actually the universe itself. So, um, um, and in fact, if you think about it, um, the, the, let me give you another example that uh, I think per perhaps drives this point as well. So, one of the obvious things about our universe is, uh, so, in the laboratory, there is, uh, for every particle, there is something that we call the antiparticle. For the proton, there exists an antiproton. For the electron, something we call the positron, right? And so, however, if you look at our universe, it's basically composed of the particle, not the antiparticle. For whatever the reason, in the, in the hot Big Bang, what's left over is just what we call the, part the, the particles, not the antiparticles. In the lab, we can produce the antiparticles, but in the, in the universe, only the particles were left, okay? Why, why did that happen? How did that happen? For a long time, we've now known what are the properties of the theory of part that a theory of particles needs to satisfy in order for th that at after the, you know, the expansion of the universe and after the universe it co cools down, all that is left is the particles and many fewer or none of the antiparticles. We know the, the conditions that your theory has to satisfy. The model that we have for particle physics in the lab so far does not satisfy those conditions. So we know for sure that there must be something else, not just to explain the dark matter, to explain us, the, the, the fact that there's more matter than antimatter. So clearly there's more things than the ones, not just the dark matter, but how matter and antimatter, uh, you know, why, why one win one over the other in, in the history of the universe and so on. There are a lot of things that we haven't yet discovered in the laboratory that clearly took place at some point in the history of the universe, okay? So, um, so it's great. The, the, the universe allows us to try to probe what happens in regimes where we cannot re yet do the experiment. Of course, this for the cosmologists, it makes it much more difficult because at the same time, you need to understand what you're seeing, what the fossils, and what the laws of physics, all at the same time, most of the time, this is not even possible. It's just too many uncertainties to sort it out. And the case of the variance is just like that. We've measured very well how much variance were left over. But we have no way of making any progress because the, the, the theory in the lab does not explain this. There's no reason why the next generation of experiments in the lab will be able to guide us in any way. So at the moment, we, ha we have this observation and we cannot really explain it with, the, with uh, the physics that we know. Okay, so, great. So, um, I want to talk now about uh, the perturbations, these diff little differences uh, that we see in the cosmic microwave background and that they then grow through the, through through the force of gravity to form um, the stars and the galaxies that we see in the universe today. That's what we think happens. So, you start with a universe that it's almost the same everywhere uh, there's a little bit more stuff in some place. The force of gravity towards that place is a little bit stronger because there is more mass, and so the mass, the stuff surrounding it falls into there, and so it accumulates. There's a little bit more mass now even than before, so more force towards there, and stuff accumulates, accumulates, accumulates. So you start with a little bit, and you end up forming some big structure there that it's a galaxy, and inside of this galaxy it forms stars. This is what, things th what we think happens. And we think, uh, based on the fact that, uh, you know, we can calculate, everything at some level, because we know the, th the theory of gravity, we know what the universe is made of now, we can compute in the computer what we think we should see when we point a telescope at this uh, something at this time in the history of the universe and that time in the history of the universe, and it all matches, okay? So we're pretty sure that this is what's happening. Um, so this is what we call the large-scale structure of the universe, so... Um, so um, uh, as... Uh, and... and um, so these are, are samplings you, you cannot see very well, unfortunately, in the slides uh, with, the, with the light. But what, what, oops, what, um, what, what I show here is some examples of measurements of how the, uni the density of the universe, how mu the material of the universe is distributed at different times. The earliest measurements that we have are from how the material was distributed 400,000 years after the Big Bang using the cosmic microwave background. Then in the more near universe, we make maps of how the matter is distributed around us by looking at where galaxies are, and each point in this plot is an actual galaxy, and you, and you, see, that, uh, you see that the galaxies congregate into regions, they form 
like more empty regions that we call voids and clusters. And so there's a big uh, structure, the galaxies themselves. So galaxies, you know, there are a lot of stars, but they are not just randomly put in the universe. They also congregate into called the uh, clusters of galaxies and filamentary structures and voids that do not show up so well in the, in the picture, but, but, uh, but they are there. So, and as, as I said, we, 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 um, we think we understand that very precisely by, uh, with this theory that I just sketched on you. Force of gravity of a universe made of a certain composition. And in fact, that's the best way we have of measuring the composition of the universe, is trying to make sure that the level of the kind of stuff that has formed at different times in the history of the universe, as we see in these different pictures, it all matches up. And it does, once you assume that the universe is made of dark matter and this dark energy. Okay? So um, these are also, again, examples that I will not, uh, that I will not go into. Um, but another thing that... Uh, that, that, that uh, I want to um, stress is this fact that uh, um, um, all the time what we are doing is we find something, for example, this cosmic microwave background from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. We try to understand it using the laws of physics, the gravitational uh, force of, of, uh, of Einstein and so on. And then what we do is uh, um, once we think we understand it, we compute what we think we should see in an experiment that we haven't not yet done. And we do that experiment and we see if it matches. And it, c it came a point in which everything started to fit. And, and so I want to give you some examples o of that also um, to illustrate um, that immediately we start having information about this, about... Uh, the various components of the universe in very different ways, and that's why we are so sure about them. So, for example, in particular, I will talk about the dark matter. I told you already how we um, now know about how much dark matter there is by making sure the level of structure that we see in the history of the universe matches up, but that's not the way it was discovered. Dark matter was discovered by looking at how things orbit in, s in galaxies, how stars move around in galaxies, and what it was found is that... Uh, like if imagine you see a solar system, okay, then and turn off the sun, okay. Still, you see all the planets moving around, right? So you can infer there's something there, and you can know how big it is because you know how how long it takes them to go around. If you know the loss of gravitation, you can figure that out, okay. In a galaxy, you can do the same thing. You take the stars, you see how they go around, and they probably go around because of the mass that's in the center, and then you figure out how much mass there should be, just as if you take the case for the sun, uh, with, uh, you, that you turn it off. Okay? And th people realized that things were going around so fast that the mass that they could see in the stars in the galaxy was not uh, enough to keep the thing going around. It, the thing was going around much faster, as if there was a much bigger mass. And that's how people introduced the so-called dark matter. Okay? Dark matter, stuff that you didn't see, but was making things go around. And this was, this was how it was discovered. Okay? But it's not... And then eventually we saw it in the cosmic microwave background, completely different situation. And that's not the, the, the counting the dark matter by looking at how much dark matter there is in, in each galaxy and multiplying by the number of galaxies is no longer the way we figure out how much dark matter there is. Because by now we've measured the dark matter using the cosmic microwave background, not even today, not even in the local universe, but 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And the whole thing only works because there is the same amount of dark, because there is this dark matter that we have found before in some other way. Okay? So let me give you some other examples about dark matter so that you, that you can uh, appreciate this fact. So the, p the whole problem about the dark matter is that it's dark. So it doesn't, we point a telescope, we don't see anything, right? So we see the thing going around, but you don't see anything. So you can always, at the and people have and continue to think about, perhaps you have something wrong about the theory of gravity or doing the calculation wrong, something, okay? But so there's, uh, I already told you some ways we've already seen the dark matter in different ways. Let me tell you another one. So one thing that happens in the theory of uh, general relativity, which was one of the original tests of, of, the, of Einstein's uh, theory of gravity, is that light gets deflected in the presence of a mass. Okay? In 1919, when uh, people were trying to test general relativity, what they tried to see is that th in the presence of the sun, the light from the background stars uh, on the other side of the sun, 
gets bent a little bit, and so the location of stars in the sky changes a little bit when you see stars that are passing very close, the la that are almost in the direction of the sun. Of course, you cannot look at stars when there is the sun there, right? So what you have to do, wait for an eclipse. The eclipse um, blocks the sun, and then you take a picture of where you see the stars there. Then you wait six months so that you can look at the same direction of the sky with the sun in the other place, in the other direction. Then you take the map, and you see that the stars are in a different location because they have been uh, changed by a little bit. That was one of the uh, first... Uh, tests of general relativity. Um, but so what we can now do, you know, a century later or something, is um, use this. If it's true that the universe is filled with this dark matter, say a galaxy is filled with this dark matter, then the, the, the light doesn't, well, bending doesn't care if the thing made is made of regular matter, dark matter, what it is, it doesn't care. It always gets bent. According to, to uh, Einstein, it gets bent the same way. Okay. So if it's true that these galaxies or these objects are filled with dark matter, we should see the effect of the dark matter bending the light, okay? And we, and we have seen it in many, many places. Let me give you some examples. So one of the frontiers today of the cosmic microwave background, uh, um, cosmic microwave background measurements is the following. There is the light of this cosmic microwave background that comes from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. In this picture, it's represented a little patch like similar to the map that I show, show you the entire map, like imagine a little region, okay? As the light travels to us, all of this structure in the universe is forming. The galaxies are forming due primarily for the dark matter. If it wasn't for the dark matter, there isn't enough time in the history of the universe to form galaxies and so on, starting with what we see in the CMB, okay? But this structure that is forming along so we are here looking in this direction, the light is traveling to us. As the is traveling, the different regions of the universe start becoming more and more inhomogeneous and forming these structures. These structures bend the trajectory of the light, okay? So it will change slightly what you should have seen in here in the absence of any structure. And we can calculate with com calculation, computer, blah, 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 how, what are, what are these uh, deformations of this map? And we can go out and, and measure and see if the if the deformations that we see in this map match what we ca calculate. Completely different place where the dark matter is entering. And in fact, in this calculation, also enters the dark energy, everything, all the whole thing, okay? And it works, okay? And by now it's been detected super accurately and we are trying, that's what we are trying, a lot of experiments are trying to do now, make better and better measurements, because this means that you can have a measurement of all the dark matter all the way to, the four to the, where the, the cosmic microwave background is coming from. And it has worked, okay? So again, another example like this. Um, we see the deflection of light uh, by the dark matter in a lot of other situations around, uh, around uh, clusters of galaxies and uh, galaxies. And the, the, we, couldn't, we, we see that, the, that there's a lot more mass and this mass is deflecting light just as we, we thought it should. So um, that's another example just to tell you that um, it's a very constrained uh, situation. So if you want to say, oh, I don't believe in dark matter, these people are crazy, okay? Which half of, uh, you know, at some point half of the people thought that, right? Uh, it's not that everybody jumps into the any given ship. But, uh, what, what happens? You start computing in your other theory, nothing is working, okay? And by now we cannot change anything. We start changing, and there's so many places in which this dark matter is entering. The lensing of the CMB, the lensing in here, the, the velocities around the, um, you know, in the galaxies, the formation of structure. So many places that we start changing something and something gets screwed up, okay? And so that's the situation in cosmology today. Um, okay, so let me... Um, let me um, talk a little bit about where these perturbations are coming from. So, um, and this is a huge discovery uh, in cosmology. Uh, uh, for me, one of the biggest discoveries uh, in cosmology in the last decades. So I told you that what we have observed is that the universe started almost homogeneous, almost every, the same everywhere. Small difference that the see we see in the cosmic microwave background. Gravity starts pulling things together and things form. Okay, but where do these little things that we see in the CMB, where did they come from, okay? And a big discovery um, in cosmology is that these little differences 
were not produced during this period of time that I'm calling the hot Big Bang that I'm discussing. They must be come from before. And let me tell you, let me try to, let's not look at the transparency, let, let me try to uh, explain to you what's going on, okay? One thing that happens in our cosmological model is the following. So, at any given time, you know, let's say today, the, hist the age of the universe is 14 billion years, okay? So, light only has 14 billion years to travel from wherever it is to us. So some place that is further away than that, that, th that, that light would take even longer to get, we cannot see, okay? So the part of the universe that we can see, we call the horizon, our cosmic horizon, a name, okay? The part that we can see. Now imagine that you were in the past, okay? If you were, for example, in the universe one second after the Big Bang, then light only had one second to move, okay? So you can only see the equivalent of one light second, Okay, um, so as time goes by, you can see bigger and bigger regions if you are there all the time. Now we are here now, but if you are there all the time, you can see bigger and bigger parts of the universe. Okay, um, but uh, the u the universe is also getting smaller, right? Because of the expansion of the universe, you can take the region of the universe that we can see now and ask the question: How big was it in the past? Okay, so we can see all the way to the 14 billion years, and then we take this region in the past. How big was it? It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But also, how much, if you are there, how much of that part of the universe you can actually see is also getting smaller. Because, say, you're waiting until one second after the Big Bang. Now you only have one light second of time to see. And the, 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 the age of how much you can see is shrinking faster than this. Okay? So this means that, um, that um, if you were in a given place, what we see now is bigger than you could... The part of the universe that we can see now is bigger than the part of the universe that we could have seen um, past. So, in some sense, parts of the universe come into view, okay? In other words, let's take the cosmic microwave background. Let's take an, a, a specific example, okay? We now see this cosmic microwave background from there, from there. Now, let's ask the following question. Let's say there was somebody there 400,000 years after the Big Bang in that direction, sitting there. What part of the universe could they see in the only 400,000 light years of time, uh, 400,000 years of time since the Big Bang that they had? They could only see a region that for us today is as big as the size of the moon. In other words, if you have some guy over there, another guy a few degrees apart, at the, at the time when... Uh, when uh, the light is coming to us 400,000 years after the Big Bang, those two guys could not see each other because they can only see a little region that now we can see them both, right? But they didn't have enough time to communicate between themselves. It is more or less clear. So, it, so if I look, I'm here, I look in this direction, okay, I look in this direction, I can see these two guys, okay? But they, this started, this, we are looking at something 400, thousand years after the Big Bang, so they can only see a region that is 400,000 light years around them. We can see 14 billion years, much further out. These two guys are separated. They, this guy can see here, this guy can see this region. We can see them both, but they cannot see each other, okay? So things in some sense, ca for, for, yeah, so, and if we were here 400,000 years after the Big Bang, we could only see a region around us like that. So we could not see what but after some time, we can. Okay, uh, we are only here now, but... Um, but, uh, okay, so... Um, so this had, has the following uh, um, very interesting point, okay? Imagine that we see something, some structure, some hot spot or cold spot in the cosmic microwave background that it is, you know, just this big, okay? Bigger than this, okay? we are seeing it at this time, we see something there, but it's bigger than even the distance light can travel from the Big Bang to, the time, to this time. Because I just told you, this guy, light can only travel from this region. Let's see, I see some building. It's not a building, but let me see. if I see a building this big, okay, something this big, there's not even time for light to travel from one place to the other to this building. Not even... And by building, what I will mean is that we see that this region of the universe has more matter than this one. This one is a little bit emptier. So presumably you could do this by moving some of the stuff from here to there. 
But in reality, you cannot do it because there's not enough time for, not even light can travel from here to there. So in this cosmological model, if we happen to see that uh, there are regions, structures, that matter has been put more here than there, and this separation is bigger than this distance that even light can travel, it must, something is wrong. How, how, how can it possibly be? Nothing can, can take things from here to there. So if this place is empty because this stuff has been moved to here, not even traveling at the speed of light, you can get to there in the 400,000 years after the Big Bang, okay, that you have time. And we can check this because of this fact that, that we can see things like this. We can see, for example, maybe some of the matter here has been taken out and put to here, but they didn't have time to communicate or send stuff. There wasn't time, but we can see them and we can check. And we indeed see differences, um, structures that are bigger than the, th th than the light crossing time at that time. Okay? So something is very weird. Okay? Um, and people started... Uh, so, you know, I, I, I gave you a cartoon, but let me tell you a little bit more extra. So people already in the 70s and so on started to try to figure out what you should see in these measurements that I told you happened much later in situations when you start with something even structures that are bigger than the, than the size of the, what you should see. They had curves and you know decades later that's what we've seen. Okay? We've now measured even the velocity of the material moving. So there's no question again calculations, decades later, observations, that we see stuff arranged over distances that are bigger than even what light can travel. Okay? So if all there was was this history of the hot Big Bang with the 400,000 years and so on, there is no, no way to create this. So this must have been created from before. Some, we need to change this story to accommodate this thing that we are seeing. And by now we've seen it with such detail and so many things that we are uh, super convinced um, that, uh, that something happened. So in some sense, this map of the cosmic microwave background is not only something that we are seeing 400,000 years after the Big Bang, but we figure out that the structures that we see are so big that they must have been produced earlier on, even earlier they have to be put in place even earlier than the beginning of this story that I just told you, the, the hot Big Bang. So there must be something before. And for me, this, is a huge, this was a huge discovery for cosmology. The story of the universe being hot, filled with radiation, expanding, and so on, is not all there is to it. And not only is not all there is to it, but we have fossils, these perturbations that have been left from the previous time. Okay? Which means that we have some hope of figuring out what might have happened before. It's great. So we both have, um, we found something strange. We know that it's coming from a period that we, that we must be different from what we are talking about. And we found a lot of this, uh, and this map is filled with details. All of these details are telling us about this time before this hot Big Bang. So, um, so for us, this was a great, uh, a great discovery. Um, now, but here, what comes to haunt us, of course, is the fact that Okay, we know that there must uh, um, be something happening here. We know it left over some stuff. But unfortunately, this is exactly the part of the history of the universe in which the things that are happening, the physics is not the one that w has been tested in the laboratory. So we are now in the business of both trying to understand what we are finding from this time and also figuring out the laws of physics at the time. Who knows if we can really do it, okay? But on the other hand, we found something from before, right? We have some, it's as if somebody found some weird bone and they don't know the kind of dinosaur, they don't know even that there is still a weird bone, right? It's a huge thing. Okay, great. Nobody believes that uh, dinosaurs could exist at, the, at this point in time. You still have a bone of something. It's not a dog, it's not an elephant, something huge. Okay, great. So maybe one day we'll find many more bones, we'll figure out the dinosaurs. But uh, it's still a great, uh, a, great, a great moment in the history of, uh, of, of, of cosmology. Um, but the interesting thing is that around the... So you might ask the question, okay, what could have happened before? Okay, what could have happened before? And we now have some story of something that could have happened before that uh, if, it, if it is what happened, it leads to a universe that is just uh, 
the way we see it. We are not sure that this is what happened, but at least we have a plausible story. And by a plausible story, I mean something just like has been happening, and I told you with the dark matter and so on, something that is a real physical theory with equations that we can compute what's going to happen next, and then we go measure and see if it does happen. So, because um, is at the beginning it's not even clear that you can in, in what that you can have something there that will produce these you know strange things and lead to a universe that lasts so long, um, and that you can still find a theory. But people in the 80s found a theory. We call it uh, inflation or slow roll inflation, um, and. Uh, you know, it's a theory where we can calculate everything, but let me just tell you I the history of se itself in the universe. It adds, in, uh, or let me just uh, say it here, it adds to, the, to this uh, history over there a period of very fast expansion, infl uh, exponential inf expansion, um, um, driven or produced by some specific type of matter that it fills the universe at this time. It lasts for a finite amount of time, then it ends. And uh, and um, if the universe went through such a period, then the universe that's left after that is like the universe that we have s that we see. Okay, we are not so sure about this as we are about dark matter and so on, but it's still something which has passed quite a few uh, interesting tests. Um, so um, let me see. Um yeah let let me let me comment on 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 one uh, again something just to illustrate this fact again that uh we usually when we start getting convinced that something might be on the right track when we introduce something for some reason and it ended up f uh explaining another experiment something we didn't think about okay and this has happened with this idea of inflation. So the original question that people had was the following. Uh, something very peculiar about the Einstein uh, equations is the following. Imagine that, uh, that uh, as I was telling you before, we think that in, the, in this hot Big Bang picture of the universe, the universe at the beginning was expanding very, very fast. Okay? So today the universe is, uh, you know, expands every 14 million years. Let's say we go to some early time in it, which was expanded, you know, every fraction of a second in double inside. Boom, 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 double, double, double. That was happening, you know, in the first fraction of a second uh, after the Big Bang, in the usual story. And then you can ask the question, let me start the universe uh, solving these equations of Einstein and so on, and let me start it and let me put some matter, let me make it expand this fast. What happens? You discover the following very interesting uh, fact, that uh, if you just are not careful enough, what happens is that if the universe was expanding in just a fraction of a second, doubling in time, um, then after a fraction of a second, either it becomes completely empty or it collapses into a black hole. If you put a little bit more matter than what is required, it collapses into a black hole. If you put a little bit less, it becomes empty very fast. However, our universe lasted 14 billion years. Okay? It Naively, uh, easily, it will stop in a fraction of a second, but somehow it lasts 14 billion years. And this you can only do in this equation if you balance very carefully how much matter you put. If you put it expand, the universe is expanding at certain amount, a certain rate. You have to put exactly the sa exactly a s very specific amount of matter filling the universe so that it will last so long. Ah, people were very confused. It looks something is very strange. It's true I can find this, but it looks very detailed. How, I how is it that the universe knew that it had to put this amount of matter expanding this in this way to last 14 billion years if you make a little mistake, boom, in a, half a fraction of a second, boom, collapses into a black hole. How? What I who engineered this? It's as if you find you know, a pencil you know, uh, like on this tip here and you get into the room, you see this pencil and you, th somebody told you, you've been there for a thousand years. Okay, uh, something. There must be some string. I mean, a thousand years, not even the building. Is here. How, how come? This is this kind of stuff. Okay? So, um, people also, th at the time, people realized that if you added a period of this uh, very exp fast expansion, then um, all the reasons the universe uh, wants to collapse, they are diluted away in some sense, and then it can last a very long time. So, said, oh, great, we can add this period. They found a way 
to fill the universe with something that will make it, accel it will make it accelerate in this way and also n and then after a while the universe would last very long and they were very happy about it um, and it was a great thing right but then I think another thing uh, happened which was the following they also realized and this was very nice I mean for me uh, one of the nicest things is that okay what 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 you invented is something that has a period of this um, very fast expansion at the beginning but it has to end so in these models there was always something that in some sense kept track of time and told the universe because the universe is not expanding like that now so stop it okay do it for some time and then start the regular thing that we've already measured there was in the model there's always such a thing I'll call it a clock there's always something and they knew you know they found some you know type of matter that acted in this way it made the universe expand only for a while and then it stopped but because the un because the universe is so small quantum mechanics is important and people know that you cannot make perfect clocks if you want that are very small in some uh, simple way and so it's impossible to make sure that the universe lasts exactly the same amount of time everywhere because in all these models the clocks are never perfect and so in some regions this e period of expansion lasts a little bit longer so they realize that and then they realize that the consequence of these clocks never be being able to be perfect is that they live, they live uh, after the, this period of slow lower inflation ends they live a universe that will last so long but it's not perfectly homo homogeneous it has little differences and the properties of these differences ended up being this is something that people figure out much before many of these measurements huh? they ended up being exactly the properties that we are now seeing in the cosmic microwave background okay this I think is something that for many people said okay there must be something to this story of adding this stuff and so these are examples of measurements that completely match what you expect from this picture again it's very I, I want to I want to um, um, make sure you get this point that yes we invent things all the time that's kind of our job we try to we find our job divides into two parts finding stuff and then trying to explain it which usually means inventing stories okay the, but the stories are mathematical calculations okay and then we start getting convinced when the, not only the story with what we invent for the story actually works but it explains something that we didn't make it do or we make another observation we find something else and it works and this one we're not so sure about this period of slow roll inflation but we are very s we wow it did do something that we were not expecting okay and so a lot of people myself included are pretty um, are pretty happy with this and think that there's, there's something to it. it we think it's probably the case that uh, so now let me just um, um, tell you about some other things uh, uh, a little bit more for for the future what cosmology is doing now um, so um, one thing that uh, so as I just told you what we are doing all the time is trying to find things so I just told you that perhaps we found some fossils from some period even before the hot phase of the Big Bang which we call inflation and so on, slow lower inflation could there something else be left okay perhaps there's some we found a bone perhaps there are many more bones perhaps there's something else so can we look for something else and we figure out a bunch of things that could be left okay because to figure out what could be left there are two pieces to that question first the question is if there was something produced at that time could it survive until today okay and this for knowing that you just need to know what's happening after that time so if there's a fossils here but there's rains and things and probably they will get washed away you will never find any bones here anymore but if there is some special kind of place that's why I guess the paleontologists go there and not here because they figure that it's, it's possible at least to find something there okay so we realize that if there were things produced er early in the history of the Big Bang in this period they could survive other additional things that could survive and one of them is what we call a background of gravitational waves gravitational waves are waves in this theory of Einstein of uh, gravity they travel around the universe they almost travel unimpeded they don't bounce into anything and that's why they could survive so if they were produced they could survive and then the other part of could they survive or not is whatever this invention that we had 
does it produce it? Does it, leave, does it make bones to the dinosaurs? Do they have bones or there's some sort of amoeba thing? It doesn't have any bones? Okay, it doesn't do it. But it turns out this inflation thing also produces these gravitational waves and they can survive. So this is a second fossil, something else that we could look for from this period. And if inflation indeed happened, perhaps we'll find it. Okay? And there's a big race to try to... And the third thing that we figure out is how to find them. There, there's three pieces. Could the thing survive? W could it be created? Do you have a way to find it? Because if it's something that you don't know how to find, then you're out of luck. But we now figure out a way to find it. We figure out it could survive. And we figure out it could be produced. So we are looking for it like crazy in something called the, co the polarization in the cosmic microwave background. Um, so, okay. So what, 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 what I try to convince you is that we have a very nice story of the history of the universe in the late stages, and for I, you know, it's it's a little bit surprising at first. It's uh, the composition of the universe is surprising. There is all of this dark matter, but by now, there's many uh, different uh, avenues that points us in that direction. We also figure out that we find something from before, from perhaps this period of inflation. Perhaps that idea is wrong, and something else needs to um, change that. But however, we found a lot of things, and furthermore. Um, there are other things that could have been produced there that we think would even be left over that we are looking for. So we have some hope of uh, even getting more certain or less certain, depending on the results of the experiments, that this is what actually happened. So this is the middle that we are in. Another question that you can ask is, constantly what has been happening is that we've expanded this history of the universe and you know we can see the time of the galaxies, something else was happening before, something else, now we said this period of inflation, is this the end of it? Could there, is that the first, is that where, how the universe is there, or there's something from before? Okay, I don't know, we don't know. But we are, uh, we, we have, uh, we, we do know that I in some sense this cosmic inflation is not a complete history. It does depend, the, the what will happen a little bit depends on what was happening before, okay? So in some sense there is a hope that Okay, there is th the point that probably something else happened before, and perhaps one day we can figure out what could be left over from that time uh, to, to, um, to try to see if we can sort it out. But again, we are always in the same situation. When we are talking about these early times, is the time where the laws of physics we don't know, and we have very few fossils, and we are in a very dicey situation. But we probably there was something before this period of slow rolling inflation that I talked about. There's probably something before. Uh, at the moment, we are not uh, in good shape to tell you what, it, what happened, but one day perhaps. But the, the current, what we are currently doing is trying to see if we can figure that this period out uh, better. And how are we going to do it? Okay, so it's always the same. We, we get this, we sort this out by finding stuff, okay? So what what do we do we build better telescopes we take better pictures of things that were happening before we do calculations better calculations to try to match them that's what we do okay and we have plenty of projects to try to make maps of the universe that are better more galaxies more uh, cosmic microwave background lensing of the cmb this that and the other and we build more telescopes and we build more uh, cameras and we spend the money of the taxpayers of the various countries doing this <laughs> uh, but I think it's wonderful, right? So, I mean, for, for all us, we doing it is great because we are sorting out what was happening in this very early history of the universe. Or even if you are just sorting out how galaxies form or in some latest... We just, it's amazing that we can, you know, through thought and experiment in the lab and a telescope, we can sort out. And the universe is so crazy, right? It's so big, it's humongously big, it's very difficult for us to even comprehend. It's super old, 14 billion years, we just say 14 million years, but just thinking about that kind of, if you stop for a moment, it's just crazy. It was very different before, it, uh, then there was this period of inflation, perhaps, and we figured that out by just measurements and thought, and it's crazy, right? And it's true, we are spending money building these telescopes, but it's not in the big scheme, well, it depends on, you know, it's... Maybe there are better uses for it, but you know it's still a great thing, okay, for me at least. <laughs> um, not for me personally, for me as an endeavor for hu for for humans to try to figure it out and measure things. Sometimes you know it leads to these things lead to practical applications, right? Okay, Maxwell invented 
and understood electricity and magnetism. Now we have phones and the quantum mechanics. And but we are not doing this for that, right? So there might be, oh, some people are, but a lot of this is just because we want to understand. And we want, it's crazy that we are able to understand by just thinking and doing experiments and doing calculations. And we just want to do it. It's not because we think that, you know, by building this better camera, then eventually the CCDs that astronomers started using decades ago will end up in something that you will call your phone. I, probably they didn't care about this. They tried to figure out if they can make pictures of galaxies further away and things like that. Anyhow, um, so we have plenty of these experiments. We, uh, we, we, we are very excited about the things that we want to learn in the next uh, decades and we hope that uh, we continue this ride of, uh, of figuring things out. But we are also realistic that uh, sometimes one gets stuck and we cannot figure it out, there's not enough information and just like in the case of matter and antimatter that I told you at the beginning that we've measured a lot of things but at the moment we don't know how to make progress. You know, a lot of these questions perhaps about the very beginning and so on, at some point we will get stuck. Hopefully the nice thing about astronomy is that there's always something new, something that uh, um, we are finding that from some different periods. So many things happen in the history of the universe that in the centuries that have passed since the invention of the telescope, we're always finding something which we are, oh, now we can understand this. And when suddenly we get stuck, oh, now we, can, uh, we found neutron stars, we found black holes, we now can look at the cosmology. So it's a great, it's always been a great, uh, a great field. So let me, let me leave you with that. Questions? Come on, come on. So the first one is always the, the hardest one. Then they'll come in a flood. But who wants to go first? Hi. Uh, I'm Fernando from UNESP, Itapeva. Uh, I'd like uh, to ask. Uh, if you know the paper from Nielsen and collaborators uh, of last year, where they, they affirm that uh, there li there's little evidence from supernovae of uh, acceleration of the universe. They say uh, at three sigma, the model with no acceleration is compatible with the last set of supernovae. Um. Okay, this is kind of a technical question. I don't know the paper, this particular paper, but um, let me address more generally. The question would be, um, the supernovae are one of the ways, the original way, in which people discovered that the expansion of the universe was accelerating. What they found is that the supernovae um, appeared 20% dimmer than what expected them to appear when they are sufficiently far away. And this was interpreted as the them being further, a little bit further away to do with the ex expansion of the universe accelerating. And since that discovery, uh, you know, the first thing to try to do, I mean, now we call it a discovery, but at that time it was some observation that we tried to find other explanations for. And the supernovae were 20% dimmer, so the obvious thing that perhaps there was something in between that was absorbing a little bit of the light, okay? Zero order explanation. And we, you know, I can go into how we rule that out and so on. Um, but as many other things in uh, cosmology, um, the, re the, the way we now measure the acceleration of the universe is not just with the supernova. We can th if you don't like the supernova, we can throw them away. We have other measurements. The, these positions of, the, uh, so measurements of how galaxies are distributed are also very sensitive to the, this acceleration of the universe. And we, use, we can use them and we have built, people have built, including uh, people from here in Brazil and so on, built surveys to go measure things, and they detected the acceleration in this completely different way, okay? Just as the story that I told you about dark matter, which I picked the dark matter as opposed to dark energy, but I could have done that one, in that you discover it in some way, then it makes a difference in some other thing, in this particular case, the clustering of how galaxies are distributed in space. You go measure that, and it matches. At, at the beginning, it just matches. Oh, great, you're happy. Eventually, maybe the second method even becomes better than the first, and you just throw out the first method because it doesn't care. You just, 
And then you find some other thing, like the lensing of the CMB also depends, and it works. So um, I'm not uh, sure about this particular paper, but the current uh, um, situation is that uh, in both for, uh, for both of these things, you, you can definitely take out if you don't believe, but which, you know, there's no reason, I don't think, to not believe the supernovae. But if you were not, if you want to take them out, you, you can see the same evidence in some other way. We usually want to get to that situation because um, one, one uh, complica complicated thing about astronomy uh, is that contrary to physics, in physics you make an experiment in your laboratory. If you are not sure about something, you can change it, okay? In astronomy, yeah, we build a telescope, but we look at something that's far away, right? And there's, also the, there's always the chance that we're not understanding something, and we cannot go there and change anything. In the lab, oh, could it be this? Okay, why don't we in change the current, put this here, and see what happens. There, whatever happened, we are taking a picture, and we are like observers, we are not experimentalists, okay? And that's a big difference, and so it's a, it's a big worry, and so we worry about it, and the way we try to go around it is by trying to measure many things. And eventually, when there's enough, then we are happy. M many times, we are not enough, and we're, there's not enough, and then, okay. We're trying to think of other ones. Okay. More questions? Vocês podem fazer perguntas em português. Eu tenho certeza que ou ou portunhol. Portunhol. I can answer in English. <laughs> you can answer in English, but uh, I can uh, listen in. Uh, but I'm sure portunhol is okay. Um, good evening, professor. Um, when you were talking about the inflation of the universe, you mentioned the need of a clock. Something, um, maybe a higher power that was telling the universe exactly the amount of matter to have and when to expand and when to accelerate the expansion. Um, I would like to know if you believe that we could link this to the multiverse theory and say that this higher power could be simply the random and we have an infinite amount of universe and we happen to live in a universe that has that certain amount of matter just by random, and the universe that didn't have the exact amount of matter and all the different laws couldn't simply not prosper enough to last so long, and we live in the universe that lasts the 14 billion years, and that's absolutely random. There is no exact reason for that, and mm -hmm. uh, we could go even further from that and say that this is the universe that has that exact charge of an electron and yeah, so yeah. on. Okay, so, um, great. So, um, let me, for everybody, um, try to um, give us some context, okay? So, mainly this question is about something that I just mentioned, which is what could have happened before this period that I call slow roll inflation? What could have happened? How could the universe be? Um, and it turns out that um, in, uh, in uh, some of these models of inflation, the part of inflation that produces uh, what we see, is preceded uh, by some, something a little bit more extreme and a more extreme uh, version of inflation, which uh, w is called sometimes eternal inflation, um, and which creates a universe in a sense uh, much, much bigger than the part that we are actually observing. And this g uh, goes sometimes by uh, the name multiverse, because the idea is, uh, okay, we see some region of the universe, it's the universe, but now, um, there is this period of inflation. Inflation, when you make something grow in an exponential manner, um, it quickly creates a lot of it, okay? And so in this example, uh, in these models, in the, some of these models, you start creating so much universe that the universe, the part that we see, is a minuscule part of the whole thing. Um, and moreover, um, in some of these examples, what could happen is that... Uh, even the loss, eventually, the universe becomes so large that it can also transition between different states of this inflationary thing. And in these uh, different stage, states, in some sense, the laws of physics, as you would measure them in a laboratory, in these very far away places, are even different. Um, and so this multiverse is really composed of many regions which might have completely different laws of physics and so on. Okay, great. So this is pure speculation, of course. I do, we don't have, um, um, uh, and that's why I didn't go into it so much. It's pure speculation, um, but it's not completely bogus speculation. It's not just words, in the sense that 
um, the same equations that I'm using, the same theory with the same equations that I'm using to explain all that I see, um, also have this other solution. Or it could be something that is happening before. So it's something that, if I believe the laws of physics that I'm using to explain everything, is also some possibility of something that could be happening. And so, um, and so it's a very interesting possibility. Uh, however, it has some problems. Uh, problem number one, at the moment, we don't know how to uh, make any kind of uh, observational probe that this is what actually happens. We would love to try to sort it out, but it's something that it's even from before, so it's even more difficult. And the other one, from the theoretical side, um, it's very difficult to make predictions. So when people try to use this theory to compute what you should observe, very quickly they start getting some sort of nonsensical answers that I can go. So the theory itself is not so much under control. And it's related to the fact that when you're going back, you're using laws of physics that you're not, you know, you're also inventing that part as you go along. So, and this, this uh, invention leads to some things that we don't know how to deal with mathematically. So we don't really know how to make predictions too well, and so we cannot com even compare with observations that we don't know what to observe, we cannot compute, so it's kind of a mess, okay? Now, it's a very interesting mess, and if you start thinking, you can invent all kinds of things, and it's great, you write books, popular books, and, um, and it's, uh, you know, it lives there in our theory, and so we don't understand it. It's very, so, I mean, take for example, a hundred years ago, theory of Einstein, black holes. Okay? Now, these days, we see black holes in the universe all the time. Okay? We now even see them merge with this light or everything. Beautiful. Nobody has any problem with black holes. But at the time, it was a solution of these equations. Nobody understood, is this real? I, what is this? Is there some problem? The solutions look like uh, they had some mathematical infinities in it. Nobody knew. Now we know how to deal with everything. Perhaps this multiverse is something like that. Now, we uh, don't understand. It's uh, completely... Um, completely confused state, but eventually, just like it happened with black holes, eventually people understood how to deal with those equations, what, what they meant, and eventually they even found it in the universe, right? Black holes. Well, maybe one day we find some fossil that says, oh yeah, this multiverse is true, but we are nowhere there, and I think uh, the, probably it will take much longer than it took for black holes, but who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Preguntas? Preguntas? <laughs> uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, as you have mentioned, the concept of slow roll inflation is quite recent, and we don't have a, a lot of control over the speculations, both theoretically and in other fields. So what I would like to ask you is quite straight to the point. Uh, what is the main uh, focus on research nowadays? And what do you believe is the main kind of evidence you hope to find in the, the next years? Yes, so um, it's true that, the, so I, I, I called it slow roll inflation specifically to differentiate it from this eternal inflation multiverse part that's even more speculative, okay? I mean, for, but perhaps from the point of view of the public is more or less the same, but however, in the case of slow roll inflation, we can compute a lot of things, we can predict a lot of things, and we can try to compare. So it's, uh, it's in a better shape, okay? Than the other. So um, what we have been able to compute is properties of these initial seats of structure. Uh, how big the differences have to be as a function of the size of, so if you ask, uh, you know, a little region is a little bit over dense, and this one is a little bit over dense, a region of this size, then you look at regions, smaller regions, how they differ from each other, and smaller regions regions of different sizes, how they differ with each other. We computed that. Um, we computed uh, histograms of, or, or how, how, how many uh, things that are very dense versus medium dense versus, you know, the average, under dense, all of, a lot of predictions like this. So we are trying to measure in detail the maps of how galaxies are distributed and the CMB to match those predictions. Uh, of these statistical properties. Unfortunately, this is not a theory that tells you, oh, when you point the telescope there, there will be a galaxy. No, it doesn't work like this. What it tells you is, it, it allows you to compute what are the chances that there, what numbers of galaxies there will be at a given time and so on. It's not, it's a statistical thing, that average number, things like that. But so we've computed all of those things. 
And so um, many of these models differ in those predictions. And so what we want to do is um, measure that with sufficient accuracy to try to tell them apart. And there are certain things that these models cannot even produce and could in principle be observed. So uh, certain properties of these st statistical properties, we now know that these models cannot produce. Um, and so we're trying to look at that because if we see it, it means that all these models are wrong. Okay? So there's things like that. And then there is these gravitational waves, this second fossil that can also be produced. We can now know how to go and find it. We are making, building telescopes to do it. Perhaps we found it. Um, now, one thing that I think you have to appreciate is that there's no guarantee that after we found all of this information, uh, uh, experiment told us this experiment, it will be enough to convince ourselves. We might be in a state in which well, it looks good, but it's not enough because there's more than one option or there are certain assumptions that we made in order to build this model that look a little bit strange and we are not sure if they are true or not. And we didn't measure enough things to convince ourselves. In, and we may well end up in that situation. I don't know. But, um, but at the moment, we are trying to collect more information. Okay. So my question is the following. Uh, assuming you have a very precise map of the CMB, and then you put that into a computer, and then you run computer simulations, and then you just let the program run, uh, will it give uh, the exact distribution of galaxies and clusters like the ones we observe today? Have you able to... Yes. Actually did it? Yes. Now, with one caveat that let me explain in, in, in this way. Um, so, um, good. So, let's say we are here, okay? We look backwards with our telescopes, okay, in this direction. When we go sufficiently far away, it's ba as we go far away, it's back in time, okay? So, we look at the CMB from this region, okay? And we think of those initial conditions, how the, we see how the universe was here. Then, we see this part of the universe as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And let's say the clusters and the galaxies that, we, that, that, that you said are happening, are forming much later, say a billion. Right? So along this direction, they are hap we see galaxies, say, here and around us as well. Okay? And so it's not that we can run... The best would be if we can measure this region here, put it in the computer, and then see the galaxies that should form there, make a map of the universe as it is now here, and see if it works. But we cannot do that because this, this place, we can only see it as it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And we can only see these galaxies from, say, this place, which is only a billion years uh, ago or something. Okay? So that we cannot do because we see the at the different times, we see it in different places. But what we can do is take this and see how many galaxies form there. Per every, you take a volume of a given size, how many galaxies ended up here, how many clusters ended up there with those initial conditions, and match and see if when we look at the universe here, more or less the same number of galaxies. If we were running the same and observing the same universe, hopefully you would see, oh, there will be a galaxy, an actual galaxy there, because there was a hot spot in the CMB, and there is where the galaxy formed. There should be another one here. We made the detail map. Because we can have to compare with another place, we can only do statistical comparisons, the number of galaxies, how they are distributed. But this is what we do all the time. We run this forward and make sure it works. That's what we do all the time in the computer. And, and, it, uh, and it For matches. the most part, it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there'll be a um, refreshment still upstairs. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, one more. Okay. Last question. So about the, the universe getting bigger, we know it is expanding and that it is accelerating. But is this acceleration getting bigger or smaller? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, so um, okay. Uh, the... the um, it's, it's all consistent um, with the rate of uh, expansion becoming constant. So not, uh, 
Um, so so um, that's what, and, and, and this happens if the universe is filled with something that we call the cosmological constant, that um, it's consistent with that. But we are trying, a lot of these experiments, what we're trying to do is exactly try to answer this question. Measure, at the moment we've measured the history of the universe uh, with some precision, and we don't see this rate of expansion getting faster and faster. We don't see it. Uh, so it, it, um, it looks like it's this cosmological constant. But exactly is the question of, for a lot of experiments, try to make it be better measurements to see if uh, this dark energy is something special that it changes these uh, this acceleration properties in, in, in some way. Because we, we were very surprised to, to see that. Um, and although we can explain it, we can in include something in our equations that make that happen and a lot of other things, we are still trying to see if we get another clue. And if, if this changed in a different way, it would be a huge clue. Um, so, yeah, this is one of the, the, the big things that people are trying to do. Okay, so just let me repeat the announcement. So there'll be chapter two of this uh, subject on August 3rd. So Raul Abramo will give a talk, but not here. It will be at Tubaina Bar, which is near Avenida Paulista. And more information you can find on our webpage or if you sign for email. Uh, and anything else? So if you want any more information about our activities, also just sign up for the email. Okay, so let's thank Matias Aldayaga for a wonderful talk. <laughs>